All right, so we're going to talk about power dynamics between people. And this is really important because I just got out of office politics, the corporate side, and I am in the digital world right now. There's different ways to view people. And I just want to emphasize that you are not superior to other people, right? It's really important to get into this understanding that people are children of God. We should treat people with dignity. And just remember who you were before you got to where you are now. Just remember that people are on a journey. No matter their age, people are on a journey. So treat people with love. This is my personal belief, but I believe that respect is earned, but I will love everyone by default. However, I will give my respect discriminately. You have to earn it just like I know I have to earn yours. Just wanted to say that right away because we're going to get into some more darker manipulation type stuff. Um, it's mostly to identify it so you can protect yourself from it, but it's also pretty fucking helpful too. But these are power dynamics with people. So we're going to discuss the unspoken rules of getting ahead in life, the insiders, the outsiders, the 48 laws of power, discernment, common triggers for irritable people, de-escalation tactics, and when to burn bridges. So there are unspoken rules, right? In whatever situation, whether you're in a corporate situation, a family situation, friendship situation, whatever it is, there are unspoken rules. And you can have two people, both went to the same school, same qualifications, whatever. But if person A knows to play by the unspoken rules of the game, they're going to get much further ahead than person B, who just sticks by the surface rules. What are these rules? This is what's known as politics. Now, if you study the courts of the medieval Europe, people were masters at this, like absolute masters. And I actually admire them a lot. You know that there's multiple layers of things going on at the same time. Like you want to present certain things, you want to hide certain things. There are unspoken rules. So let's get into that. So the first principle to remember is that people will help those who look like them. Always. Like people will prefer and give preference to people who look like them. Now that could be physically, like racially, or that could be people philosophically on the same team, ideologically. Oh, you're a Democrat. I'm a Democrat. Let's support each other. I don't care what you've done. I don't care if you've gone to that weird island. I'm going to help you, right? Or it could be socioeconomically. So there are different ways to look at this, but it basically comes down to us versus them. And just understanding in this in your bones is going to give you a lot of peace of mind because it's just the truth, right? It's just how it is. Now, you can leverage this to your benefit. And rather than complaining about this and trying to f fight an uphill battle to change human psychology, don't. Just leverage human psychology. And this is just one of the truths you have to accept is that people will help people on the same team. Like, that's a fact. All right, so what can you do? Just get on the same team then, right? So there are insiders and outsiders. Insiders have access to information. So you need to get close to the decision makers. You need to get maybe not gossip directly. I mean, you may have some distance, but you should identify the gossipers, identify the people who are social climbers and get information. Always have information because when it comes to decision time, when it comes to promote, it's much better and much easier to promote someone who knows more, not from a blackmailing perspective where like they can't fire you because you know something you shouldn't, but from a more operational standpoint. For instance, I've seen this a lot in the corporate world. We have analysts who only do their job, their tasks, and then you have other analysts who got to know the client. They know that client A hates client B and that we're competing for certain contracts. And last year they underbid us by like $3 million. Like knowing the politics behind the scenes makes that other analyst much more favorable than the other one who literally just put his head down and did the work. So you have to collect information. Now there's different ways and ethical ways to collect information. I don't care how you do it personally, but you have to get information on people. Personally, I don't like to gossip. I don't like to be seen in the in the area gossiping, but just identify people who are gossipers, who are social climbers, and get information from them. So there's at least one degree of separation. So that is the lowest hanging fruit because as you get information, you can then leverage that information and gain more influence in decision making. So say there's a meeting and people want to do business with a certain company, or a certain person, you can say like, hey, actually, I'm friends with someone who went to business with that person, and that person's pretty sketchy. So I would caution you guys into going to business with the person. You just leverage that information. You gave them information that they didn't have, and now you can influence decision making. Because now when they launch an investigation and they figure out, oh yeah, this guy is sketchy, you just got promoted in their eyes. Like this is a valuable person who collects information outside of their tasks. 
Not only that, in the process of becoming an insider, you'll notice that you're going to develop a stronger network. Like people trust you with more things and you actually develop a strong relationships with people. You start getting more secrets. You start getting more information. And in turn, you get more influence. So it's like a positive feedback loop. Now compare that with outsiders. Outsiders, most of the time I've seen it, they do this to themselves. Very few instances I've seen leadership exclude people outright. But I've seen a lot of people just do it to themselves. They put ceilings on themselves. They don't they aren't curious to get more information. They don't want to do more outside of the role. And so that actually imposes a ceiling on them. And these people aren't really self-aware. They don't know that what they're doing is harming them. For instance, they might have ideas for innovation and how to do things differently. But what they don't really know is that they're actually rocking the boat. And of course, it's every company wants to innovate and do things better. But there's a certain way of introducing ideas. There's a certain way of wanting to innovate. Because if you just show up and rock the boat and really put your ego out there, be like, hey, how you're doing things is wrong. You're going to piss a lot of people off. You're going to piss the wrong people off in particular. So just identifying where you stand on the fence, are you an insider or are you an outsider, can really help you identify how much leverage you have in an organization. So take inventory right now in your workspace or in your friend groups. Are you an insider or are you an outsider? So I kind of touched on this before, but you need to learn the chain of command, like who reports to whom. And that is one of the most important things you can do when you're new to a team. Your primary goal is to map out this unofficial organization chart. So this unofficial org chart is going to be your primary tool. Once you're done identifying formal powers, you need to uncover the informal powers. These are the influencers. Influencers are the people who may not have authority to make decisions, but they have the leverage to influence decisions. So these are the five types of influencers. There are gatekeepers. These are the people who have access to top decision makers, but they decide who gets to talk to them and who doesn't. In my estimation, these are the most important type of influencers. These are the people who have access, right? Then you have veterans, people who have been in the organization the longest. Then you have experts, people who, if you want to get shit done, you need these people. Then there are socialites, people who are known and respected in the organization, and they can introduce you to the right people. So these are like the glue guys. And then you have advisors. These are the people who have trust. So if you really want to break into the trust aspect, maybe share some kind of secret, where the, whether it's true or not, and really try to break into that trust, then you need to connect with these people. But I would focus on identifying those gatekeepers. When I was doing this at the office, I focused all my attention on those gatekeepers. I believe those gatekeepers, actually the socialites were pretty helpful too. So we had all hands meetings and I would get really close to the socialites because eventually the managers would come in and talk to them. But gatekeepers and socialites, very key to identify these two because they're not official titles, but precisely because they're unofficial titles, they have a ton of leverage. Now let's get into the 48 Laws of Power. So this is another book by Robert Greene. I'm reading it right now. So I suggest you guys screenshot these next few slides. I'm only going to highlight a few of them that I believe are the most important for me and the ones I've used the most. You guys should explore them at further depth, but let's go. So ironically enough, the first law is the one I use the most is to never outshine the master. So I've been in business for myself for just over a year and I'm constantly in rooms with people that are doing way better than I am. They have all these skills, they have all these networks, they have all these tools. And so I am by definition a newbie. And so by definition, as someone who's new at something, I'm ass. I'm terrible at stuff. Like when I first started, I didn't even know what a CRM was, right? And so as I got better and I got better and I would reconnect with certain people, I had to play dumb. I had to not outshine the master, particularly when I got onboarded for like a new team, for instance, I could not say, hey, the way you guys are doing this now is obsolete. Like you guys don't even have a funnel. You guys just have a website. Like I cannot say that type of stuff because if I outshine the master, then I'm going to get kicked out. I'm going to lose access to all the tools. I'm going to lose access to the platforms. So you guys should be aware of not outshining the master. You want to actually live maybe one or two degrees below the master so that you're outside of any retaliation range. But this is a huge one. The next law I use pretty frequently is to court attention at all costs. So in my stories, I like to post obscene shit from time to time. I like to, in person, I like to say certain things. I don't peacock that often when I dress, but like, you know, just like call attention. I can grow a mustache in two weeks, pretty thick one. Like I call attention to myself. 
and not in a clown type of way, but being able to recognize that bad attention is better than no attention. So being able to leverage attention because we're in an attention economy is very important. So this one is something I learned in the last three years is to avoid the unlucky. Like there are people, and I didn't believe this at first, but now having lived life, like there are very negative people out there. There are people who just do not want to help themselves and they're just consistently negative. And so all of life is energy and frequency. And so you have to avoid these type of people because their negativity is contagious. So that is a hard lesson I've had to learn, but this is very key. Like if there's someone who's absolutely negative and toxic, cut them off. And there's different ways of burning bridges. Like I try to avoid burning bridges at all costs, but like if you have to, I just ghost. You don't have to send them a goodbye message. You don't have to make it official or anything. That actually makes it worse. Just slowly avoid contacting them and then that's it. The next law is to use absence to increase respect and honor. Maintain a degree of distance and scarcity to increase your value and make others appreciate your presence more. Don't respond to every single text, especially if it's not necessary. You don't have to go to every reunion. You don't have to go to every group meeting. Like you don't have to do all this stuff. Make your time valuable because it is, and that will make your absence felt. Now I talked about this one a little bit in the mental mastery modules, which is to be very careful with monk mode because isolation is dangerous. You do not want to isolate yourself too much because you need to build alliances. Like at the end of the day, you need to like use people, leverage people, have those connections because being completely isolated, being a Bruce Wayne in his tower and during those years, that did not help him at all. Remember Gotham went to shit. The other thing is to play a sucker to catch a sucker. I do this a little bit too well. Um, I play the idiot a lot to be able to understand people a little bit better. I've identified a few scammers, like people who I thought were doing honest work, but then I realized that like, oh shit, you guys are just not really like doing anything constructive. So you can just identify certain people, like play along a little bit. This has been an absolutely powerful tool. Just play a little bit dumber than you actually are. Then remember to enter action with boldness. You need to take massive action, success of speed, if something makes sense, and commit to it fully. Just burn the boats. Somewhat along the same lines is to master the art of timing, understand when an opportunity is in its infancy, how to jump on it, when to leave, when to cut your losses. This is very key. And then finally, being able to identify group leaders, and that way you can affect the entire masses. For instance, at my corporate job, I remember that if I really needed something from my manager, I would talk to the vice president because the vice president and I, we lived in the same neighborhood. And so I would just talk to him if I really needed something done, because then that would trickle down to the entire management branch. So there'd be 10 managers. And then what I told the VP would trickle down. And then eventually when I do talk to the manager, the manager already knew what I needed and it was just done, right? The other thing is to never appear too perfect. Display your flaws and weaknesses because it makes you more human. People don't like the perfect image of someone. It's pretty intimidating, but it's also pretty cringe and fake. Now, 48, assume formlessness. You don't wanna to be too rigid where you break. Like You need to be able to adapt and change your strategies and tactics as needed. You don't wanna be so arrogant and fully committed to one thing that you actually end up costing things for your team. So being able to understand, again, when to cut losses, it's very important. Do not be a victim to your ego. Now, when discussing human psychology, we need to look at discernment. So discernment is being able to identify evil people. Building that discernment muscle is huge here. So there's actually a book called Dark Psychology and Manipulation. And I just want to emphasize again that this slide is to be able to identify these tactics to protect yourself and others. It's the same reason why we learn how to fight. We learn how to fight to protect ourselves and others. That's the same principle here. So by understanding what manipulators are trying to do, like what their playbook is, then you can identify what they're trying to do and then stop it. So these are the ways to manipulate someone. And we call it dark manipulation because they're pretty covert. So the main way to do this, the backbone of this, is to create open loops and expectation and anticipation because the mind hates open loops. So for instance, if you text a girl, right, and she responds, and then you wait 12 hours to respond, and then she responds immediately back, and then you just respond immediately back, and then you go back and forth for a few minutes, and then you take another 16 hours to respond, that is intermittent reinforcement. So when you do that, you actually build unpredictableness, which fucks up your dopamine. It really becomes addictive. So being able to be hot and cold, like being both their source of pain and pleasure, 
it makes you really addictive as a person. People do not like that inconsistency. It drives them crazy. It, it like fucks up their dopamine, right? So you, by doing this, you actually make others crave your approval. Now, this does not work on people who are self-aware and are healthy, like spiritually healthy, because people who are spiritually healthy and high quality, they know how to self-validate. But here's the wild thing. The majority of people cannot self-validate. A lot of people, the majority of people, they look for their validation externally. Like that's the vast majority of people. So if you belittle their accomplishments and you make them feel special and you go back and forth, back and forth, and you love bomb them, for instance, right before you like fuck them up, that makes you super addictive as a personality. Like people actually are drawn to you, which is fucked up. So if you can notice someone starting to love buying you, giving you a lot of praise, and then randomly they're pretty mean to you, just know this is a person who's trying to manipulate you. So the best way to avoid this is just to not play into their game. Build that perceptual mastery and just not play into their game. Like I can self-validate. Like I don't need anyone else's approval. I've come across people who try to do this and I'm just like, all right, I'm just not gonna interact with you then, cool. Like these people look for victims. So don't be that victim for them. Now, there are six types of toxic people, but I'm going to focus on three, and you should avoid all of these people. The first is the complainer. This is the most common type of difficult, toxic person to deal with because they are just unhappy, and they express their unhappiness in a way that can be frustrating for others. No matter what you do, if you give them the answers, the solutions, what they need, they're still going to complain about it. They're always just looking for a way to complain and just not take action. So these people take a lot of mental space. They take an emotional toll on you. So just avoid complainers. Identify, oh, that's just a fucking complainer. I'm not going to talk to that person. Similarly to that, there's people who are just constant critics. There's people who cannot appreciate good things, mostly because they are not creative themselves. They cannot do anything for themselves. They're not a productive person. They, know, they don't know how to create things of value. And so rather than fixing themselves, they constantly critique other things and other people. So just avoid that type of negativity. There are people who are just built like that and they don't want to fix themselves. So just avoid those people. And then lastly, there's the drama queen. There are people who love to cause drama and tension, even if nothing's wrong, particularly if there's nothing wrong because they don't have the ability to create anything from themselves. So they just love to stir in drama and play people against each other. So these people are sociopathic. They know people's triggers, they identify people's triggers and they weaponize them. So I avoid all these toxic people, but these three in particular, if I identify these traits in someone, I'm not talking to them. Now, what if you can't escape these type of people? What if they're your boss? What if they're your mother? What if like, how do you de-escalate these moments of high tension? Well, first is that you identify why they're irritable in the first place. Like there's different types of stress and these are the types of stress right there. There's triggering events where like people experience verbal abuse or trauma and they immediately lash out if they think the type of behavior is directed towards them. These types of triggers like just immediately lead to an outburst. So just identify their triggers, for instance, in that case. The first step is to understand why it is that they're irritable. And that way you can identify those situations. And if you can't avoid that person, say it's your mom, then you can avoid those triggers or do your best to avoid those triggers. Now, these are the eight tactics to de-escalate these types of situations. The first is to just not give them what they want. Don't react. Like you don't have to engage. The second is to develop a rapport with them, maybe based on something they like, maybe on something they want. Practice empathy. Remember, don't put yourself in their shoes. Put the emotion in their shoes. The next is to stand up for yourself. Sometimes these people just need a slap of reality. Just, just stand up for yourself. Next is to focus on what you can control. The next is to practice self-examination. Are you consciously or unconsciously touching their triggers? Of course, they shouldn't react that way, but is there something you're doing that could make things a bit easier? The next is to treat the person with kindness and respect. It's a slow burn, but kindness does kill. And then eight, it's really important. Just Q-tip, don't take things personally. Quit taking things personally. And then this is my favorite one, is to picture their asshole. So when people scream, when they yell, you'll notice that if you yell, your asshole actually pulses like a dog. If you would notice a dog when it barks, it like pulses, right? So when someone's yelling at you, their asshole is going fucking haywire. It's going crazy. So that brings some levity to my mind when I'm in a situation like that. I don't take things personally ever, but that is another step that really helps with that situation. So 
Now, when you're going to engage with these people, there's two rules of thumb. The first is to use I statements because this avoids shifting the blame on them. They don't want the spotlight of the aggressor. So if you focus on how what they're doing makes you feel and use I statements, it makes it much more easier to communicate with these type of people. The next is the one to three rule. Like if you have to engage the person, if you have to confront them, do it only one out of three times. Like you don't have to react every single time, obviously, but maybe have a one out of three so that you can say, hey, you're being fucking crazy. I let time A and time B slide, but what the fuck's going on? So I have a personal belief. It's not really common, um, but I don't believe in burning bridges. Like I, I try to avoid doing that at all costs because there's a reason why that person's in your life. Um, I would just slowly stop talking to them, but like completely cutting someone off cold turkey is pretty aggressive. But if you do need to do it, of course, go ahead and do it. But there's only one type of person that I've cut off completely, like burnt bridge, and those type of people are actual psychopaths. So I have met and have been friends with actual psychopaths, and some of them I actually know how to manage it pretty well, so I'm still friends with them, but you need to identify which of your friends are psychopaths. And there's actually, it's not that many. I think it's like 1% of people or something, but it's still millions of people. And in particular social circles in certain uh, industries, they're going to be a higher percentage of them. So I know a lot of psychopaths and there's a way to identify them. So one thing these people do, you'll notice is that when they talk, they show their sclera. So it's like the white part of the eye, especially the area on top of the iris. These people, when they talk, they show the top of their eye. That is one of the identifiers. Another thing is that these people get off on outwitting people, particularly people who are out to get them. They love to outwit other people. So one thing you need to be careful of is when you do open up to these people and you share an insecurity, these people almost always leverage that insecurity against you. And that is one way they deflect. Whenever they fuck up and they get caught, they will never, ever, ever take accountability. These people just never take accountability. They always have a reason why they did what they did. And one way that they do this too is weaponizing competence. So it's actually playing into the 48 laws of power. They pretend that they're dumber than they actually are. They pretend that they can't do something just to avoid doing it altogether. So that's weaponized incompetence. However, and this is somewhat of an admirable trait, when they do know that they want something, they go after it without hesitation or remorse. But the key there is they often do it at the expense of other people. So I would never cross that line. I, I think that it's pretty hurtful, but being able to identify these people, I would highly suggest that if you do need to cut someone off, if they're not a psychopath, don't do it because actual psychopaths will hurt you. All right, so your homework for this module is to identify the top two laws of power you've been using all along and with maybe without knowing, but there are two laws of power you've been using all along, what those are, and also identify two laws of power that you would benefit from adopting. Oh, this is interesting. I could actually use that in X and Y situation. Like, what are two laws of power you could start using right away? And also identify, are you an insider or outsider in most of your social circles? Go through the breakdown. See if you actually have influence in the group. See if you are always missing out on information or not. You know, just see if you're an insider or outsider. Also identify who are the influencers in your social groups and connect with them. And then finally, next time a toxic person engages with you, identify which manipulation tactics they're trying to use on you. That way you can identify it and you can respond and do something about it. So that is your homework for this. So that has been the social mastery modules. I'm excited now because now you know how to weaponize charm. You guys can talk to girls. You know how to open conversations with people and you know how to leverage power dynamics.